thanks to you all for coming. It's great to see such a full room. And a uh, big thanks to you guys at Axioma. The whole crew are really great. It's really interesting to see this show, which, which we've showed in our own gallery, in a very different, kind of just mediated in a different way. And it's really, that's very satisfying for us. And you do a really lovely job here. We're very happy to be here. So thank you. Mark's going to start with just a short introduction to Furtherfield. So the bulk of this conversation is about blockchain. Uh, for, let's do a quick survey. How many people in this room have heard of the blockchain? OK, uh, Bitcoin? OK, so but slightly more Bitcoin, most people blockchain. Who would be confident to uh, give a description of what the blockchain is? OK, okay. okay. I've, 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 I've got a new uh, form of personal torture, which is defining the blockchain to a room of people who really know what the blockchain is. But this is slightly more comfortable. Don't worry, we will try and give some kind of workable definition so you know why we think it's important and what it works with. And uh, so we'll have the introduction to Furtherfield from Mark. We'll then uh, give, an, uh, give a kind of description of what led us down this path from being an organisation that has worked with uh, the internet and network cultures and, and why we felt that this was an important area to be working in. We'll talk about some examples of the work that we've been doing and end with a kind of presentation of the book, but also that, that kind of crosses over with a number of works in this show. So we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in the work. Uh, and obviously afterwards you're welcome to come and interrogate us and ask us anything that wasn't clear in the presentation. So, Mark. Okay, so as you heard, Furfield uh, was going since 96, but it's, it's got a, bit, a little bit of an earlier incarnation as well, where, where uh, we come from pirate radio and pirate television and bulletin board systems before the internet. And so uh, what the spirit of Furfield is like community, uh, uh, building your own platforms, uh, uh, building your own infrastructures and connecting up through networks and seeing what values come out of that process. And it's usually free and open source uh, software as part of that, part of tools that you used, that you used. And as you can see here, this is uh, a gallery in the park, which is quite a small gallery. Actually, it's, it's not so much different than this, actually. And uh, except we've got a park, which, and, we, which we, uh, and what the park does to us is that we've realized uh, more within the last five years uh, how serious uh, permaculture is and how uh, we need to use permaculture to readjust our relationship with technology. So it's kind of, so the, the people in the park are kind of people that we can test it on and uh, explore some of the new ideas and then they can uh, get involved with some of the projects, which they do. And we've got permaculture workshops where people just learn about systems thinking and technology and nature on these workshops. And so, as I said, we were grass, we're actually a grassroots organisation and we do get Arts Council funding, but we also have to find an awful lot of other money from other places as well, from doing projects. And this is our current website. And as you can see, where lots of debate happens on there. And, so, and as we said, we're a community, we're a platform as well online, but we don't see ourselves like a centralised group. We see ourselves as a kind of like an assemblage. I know it's trendy to think about rhizome, but we don't think it in that way. It's much more where we're a collection of things like, you know, people, computers, networks, platforms, nature, sex, whatever you fancy. It all comes part of a, a net and as a whole ecological thing. And it's about they all inform each other rather. And so the idea of flatness isn't necessarily a true way of looking, it's a collection of different things that help each other. I just wanted to bring a, f a few influences. I mean, obviously, our real early influence is post-punk culture, where you make, if you want to make a record, you get your own record label, you get your own band, and that's why we had pirate radio stations and pirate television stations and BBS systems. Furfield's the same exactly the same thing, but it's on the internet with the same kind of spirit. So it's not really about... Uh, so when, when we start having a gallery, which we discussed, which is like in 2004, showing digital art, 
and stuff like that. We've got a curator coming from, say, uh, the Royal College, who thought he knew exactly what type of artists we should have in the space. And uh, he had a whole list of artists, and they're all from Biennales around the world, and we just said, no, rubbish. And so we wanted, it's much about the work, it's about the context. We're much more interested in that kind of thing because the work has more meaning than status. And so Gregory Schillet says the same thing in his own way. And uh, he recently brought a book called uh, Art and Politics in the Age of Enterprise Culture. And uh, it's been a very influential book on us more recently, although we've been doing it for years anyway. Uh, but he sees, as you see here, uh, art culture, the art world culture, views things in a very skew if way, very strange perspective. And he kind of uh, explained it, hence the title of Dark Matter, mm. where, uh, where he borrowed the term from science, refers to the immense quantity of non-reflected material that we cannot see out there in the universe, in theory, the invisible matter makes up most of the universe and is estimated to constitute 84%. So if you can imagine you're coming down from a spaceship down to Earth and you just see all the lights on, yeah? In a way, what he's trying to say is that percentage is what the established art world views as art. But the, the rest of it in between the lights is ignored. But it's used as a resource. And so, in a way, and, and that's obviously a very simplistic way of saying it here, but the book itself explores it in a much more deeply way, and he's worked with, say, people like Lucy Lippard, who we value as well. We've, we've really enjoyed, for years, Donna Harrow, we've really been interested in, and, and our work is also a critique on the patriarchy, it always has been. And uh, so, and that's always made it difficult uh, when we're kind of like uh, working with different uh, places. Uh, but what it does, it, it makes you define the motive of why you're existing in the first place, and it makes your vision sharper and your curatorial position more clear as well. And so, as it says here, by the late 20th century, our time, a mythic time, we are all chimeras. Uh, theorized and fabricated hybrids of machine and organism. In short, we are cyborg. The cyborg is our ontology. It gives us our politics. Now, the way we read that is very much not that we're all going to end up literally like cyborgs and pulling eyes out and flicking them in the corner somewhere. It's actually about where you take control of the technology yourself and you become part of that technology and you claim it and you use it rather than hide from it. So any of the issues that you have with the technology at the time, you have to deal with head on, and you take advantage of that vulnerability. So our approach shows how all our lives are bound up with what Donna Haraway calls the integrated circuit, which is this comment's related to, of high-tech capital, high capital. And so exploiting rather than denying the conditions that expose, expose our vulnerabilities, so neoliberalism exposes our vulnerabilities. Uh, and also high-tech exposes our vulnerabilities, like surveillance, etc. Uh, we engage with the entrapments uh, imposed top-down by those who dominate our social, cultural and psychic narratives. And so uh, uh, it's part of the adventure. It's not part of the fear. We enjoy the challenge, you know. It's part of a decision you make. If you make good music, do you, you want to be Joy Division or do you want to be... You know, you make that decision, and uh, it just means something to, to come from this perspective. In 2015, so we've, as Mark said, we've been receiving uh, public funding, so a small amount of very welcome public funding from the Arts Councils since uh, 2006. With political shifts, this funding is really heavily under pressure, very competitive, and we're increasingly uh, compelled to uh, match this funding and draw down funding from many different areas. So we're encouraged to get corporate sponsorship, to get private, to do private contracts, all of this kind of stuff, which uh, they provide a big pull on our attention and on our resources in order to kind of do this and often set up kind of political tensions, as you can imagine. 
So in 2015, we launched a programme that we called Art Data Money, which was a programme of arts, labs and debate uh, to build a commons for arts in the networked age. So it was this idea that what we wanted to do was to preserve uh, what we had valued about the web culture that we'd grown up with and been a part of, this sense of uh, free sharing, uh, collaboration, very experimental free collaboration, and to maintain this space of, of freedom to explore and do, do strange things with, you know, like to use these things in a, in a subversive way, as well as a way that kind of shows the full range of expression and kind of utility in the, in the technologies that are such a big part of our life. Mm -hmm. Since we've been through this program, we've, we've kind of identified more recently a kind of uh, or we've articulated m more what the problems we feel they are so the arts have got a problem and this is certainly true in the UK I don't know how much of this will resonate for you here but there is an aw very awkward relationship between the value of arts to society and the way it's resourced and funded so funding comes from public corporate and private and now public and corporate and private are actually kind of getting in bed with each other. So we've just recently had the announcement of Elizabeth Murdoch, the daughter of Rupert Murdoch, owner of Sky, Fox News, etc., has just been appointed to the National Council of the Arts Council. Uh, so this is, uh, this is you get, uh, maybe you understand why that feels uncomfortable. Um, also the kind of uh, questions of value across social, economic, and the kind of innate value or the core values of what arts practice are. There's a growing inability of existing arts economies to support younger artists to thrive and really kind of quite, uh, like really difficult levels of precarity, especially in London, it's really hard for young artists to find any way to make a living and to have any time or resources to develop their own work. Uh, increasing centralisation and, and kind of sameness in arts production and engagement because what we find is that those who have access, whether, they're, whether it's private access to resources, they are then the people who have, have access to the arts markets and you see a kind of sameness in the kind of work that's being produced. Uh, and then arts as a vehicle for speculation and money laundering which of course then kind of I mean you can really have fun with that stuff and lots of that there is interesting work being made around this but you know it I think it's worth noting that it's happening and talking about it uh, we announced this and then we kind of put out this bold statement about what we were going to do and then uh, attracted lots of very smart people who came and told us why it was a stupid idea, why we needed to approach it differently, which is kind of a tactic. So you make a bold statement and then that's a way to attract smart people to come and work with you. And that's, that's kind of been the, that's provided the compost and the resource for the, for the work that we've done since. Uh, so this is the timeline really since uh, Art Data Money Programme. And uh, and we just wanted to just run through you uh, some of the events and projects that have evolved since then. And each of them in their own right have got their own uh, complexity and different forms of production and processes. So uh, Art Data Money uh, was a kind of like the web page that we set up and then it became a, a kind of uh, community uh, evolving around uh, critique around uh, economy and ecology. And then the human face of crypto economies was, uh, was that the first exhibition? That was our first exhibition, yeah. yeah. Uh, which, uh, which we did want to say blockchain because we're not really, uh, blockchain isn't the world for us. We're not trying to promote blockchain. We're trying to explore it, uh, just like you would explore the internet. It was also about just exploring money. Because we needed to explore money. I'm the, I've, I've kind of grown up just like finding money the most boring thing. It's especially boring when you can't get at it. But it's very. But I found it very boring to think about. And we want. We felt like we needed to really understand what money. Start to understand what money was, what it is as a medium. And if any of you have really done that as artists, the world starts to go really wavy when you start looking at money and kind of how it functions. And that's kind of what that show is about. And then we made. Uh, the blockchain film, change, change everything forever, uh, which 
is very highly visited on YouTube, very, one of the most popular blockchain films out there, which we didn't expect. It was the first film that critiqued blockchain and uh, by people that were involved blockchain culture, like uh, activists, hedge funders, all kinds of people involved in it, and writers. And so that was a, a quite a successful film because that film kind of uh, reflected the spirit of the direction that we wanted to go in, in critiquing blockchain culture and seeing some of the kind of uh, pitfalls of what that is uh, bringing about today, especially Bitcoin. We started working with uh, Ben Vickers uh, at the Serbertine Gallery. Yes, yeah, so we had this, uh, we had a workshop and then a symposium to look at blockchain's potential in the arts and we invited uh, arts funders, uh, policy makers and academics and uh, to come and just kind of start to try and get their heads around what the opportunities and problems might be. And then uh, New World Order, which is the first version of this, uh, which is our space and is, and is now touring the world, which we've already mentioned. And then the book, which... Do you want to pass me the book? Which, do you want me to uh, do this? Yeah, no. <laughs> but basically, uh, it's a very good book and explains things literally. It's like a guide, but it's also a critique. But we're very pleased with it because, uh, in a way, it takes the blockchain seriously. And people who don't know about the blockchain, it's really useful. It's also useful for people that uh, uh, know about Bitcoin but don't know about blockchain. And they kind of know a bit, but also someone who actually does know about blockchain. Uh, because a lot of people that know about blockchain don't know how to look at it differently. And that's what's so valuable about this book. So that which is published to Liverpool Press, and as we said, that sold out, and so and all that money money goes to the publisher. And now we're gonna earn our own money from recently, which is probably not that much, but rather than it all going say to Amazon or to or to Liverpool Press for the book. And then there's Dawo, which I think you should explain. <laughs> so uh, the Dawo series of workshops, basically we have a series of blockchain workshops, blockchain and arts workshops. So they're really looking at what the opportunities are. They're running over six months. They're part of the State Machines program. Uh, Yanis came and participated in the last one, which was about identity. And it's really about bringing artists and developers and philosophers and uh, entrepreneurs into a space so people who wouldn't necessarily be in the room together to start to find ways to bridge and to have a conversation with each other and to find out where the problems are and what's going to go wrong and what might go right. So like Daiwo comes from uh, a post do it yourself culture where we uh, decided in 2006 to create a whole new practice, uh, rather stupidly, uh, but uh, called do it with others rather than do it yourself. And, uh, and that was how uh, you have collective genius rather than individual genius. And, and a uh, DAO is a distributed autonomous uh, organisation. Uh, it, it, I'm going to come to this a bit later, but it's essentially it's an automated organisation that sits on the blockchain. So a DAO is a distributed autonomous organisation with others. So we're trying to kind of push forward this idea that we need to create the world together with more diversity to collaborate on the production of but, things. But, I mean, this is all very real stuff, you know, like we're working with lots of different people and uh, we're being educated as much as uh, our peers and learning lots of really new stuff, which is exciting. And also learning uh, a lot more about uh, more positive uh, examples of how to use blockchain and like fair coin on Bitcoin culture and different things like that. But this is a little uh, example of, uh, well, actually, this is from New World Order, this one. We wanted to bring a bit of the nature inside to our space. Uh, we wanted to show this slide because it kind of shows the difference of approach in the curation of the show. Uh, this was uh, our version of New World Order was a lot less elegant than this show, I would say. It had quite a lot of dirt in it. But we do like dirt. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the book. And by talking about the book, I'm going to talk about a number of the work, the artworks in this room. It's a book edited by Mark and I, Nathan Jones and Sam Skinner. We kind of proposed it as a future artefact of a time before blockchain changed the world. 
it's really interesting. One, one of the things that's been kind of most difficult about kind of engaging with the blockchain is that it's really hard to get a sense of how developed things are. After making the film uh, back in 2016, we were told that at that point, the blockchain was at the same stage of development that the web was at in the late 1980s. So the infrastructure, the tools, the vocabularies, it was at a really early stage. So we'd had this kind of sense that the hype had so overshot what was actually on the ground that it made it very hard to get a sense of what was possible and what was real. So our way of getting our heads around this was to say, OK, let's speculate. Let's speculate on what the future is and have people understand as hard as they can of what's at the basis of this and what ideas are behind it and to think about what the future is going to look like. So it intersects artistic, speculative, conceptual, technical engagements with this technology that is super, super hyped. And I just want to kind of restate, we should restate this about every five minutes and it is a problem this is not a marketing campaign but an alert this shit is here it's happening there are people who are making really kind of fundamental changes to our kind of communication infrastructure and it's impactful so our film was called the blockchain change everything forever and this was a very kind of deliberate tactic we wanted to befriend the blockchain evangelists so that we could walk into a room and have a conversation with them and we wanted to strike terror into the hearts of everybody else because it's it's something that really has a kind of potential to do some quite strange things ah oh, here we go okay so the the blockchain it was a technology that was kind of launched in 2008 by a uh, mysterious uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. So we don't know who this person is or whether it's a group of people, but it came out of uh, the cypherpunk. So these are crypt crypto, crypto geeks who've been working for 30 years. They come from a, a kind of fairly specific political background which really believes in liberation from the state. So it's a it has, has a kind of libertarian philosophy behind it. And uh, it, it coincided with the crash, the financial crash in 2008, or almost exactly. And it offered a decentralized database that is cryptographically secured by a network of computers. One of the reasons we made this book is because it's, it's really hard to talk about things that are so dry and feel very boring to most people. Some people are very excited by that sentence, but most that sentence is actually quite meaningless to most people, and it's quite hard to think about why that's important or interesting. But if we understand that uh, banks operate by holding a ledger, so a database of every transaction that is made by anyone, every time you make a payment, it's recorded on a database somewhere. And uh, we have to trust that they are doing what they need to do with that data. And if we want to know where the money is, we need to go to the bank and they, we need to kind of have authority and all of this kind of stuff. So we have currencies that are run by people who, are in, who have the network of, the, of computers, who, who are running the same software over a network of computers. The value of that currency is then set in the same way that all money is set by the market by what the value by what people will pay for that for that currency and what they will spend it on and what how much they'll pay for stuff um, what happens in 2013 is that we get the next blockchain which is ethereum which starts to do something different which is it allows you to make this money programmable so the the transactions become pro programmable so we end up with pieces of software that can travel around the net and I think of these as uh, um, viruses with wallets in their pockets so these are pieces of software that can go and spend money receive money and act autonomously they don't need a human being to sign it off it can just go and act and you can start to get co quite complex agreements made between pieces of software that can then have a kind of knock-on effect. Why it's important is because, well, 
depending on who you talk to, why it's important. So for the people who proposed it, it, was, it can be read as a critique of corruption of banks and states operating in collusion with each other. So with the big, the big bailout of the banks, billions of pounds of taxpayers' money to secure the banks, to stabilise the banks, that has then never been paid back. So this becomes a way for people to possibly, the ideal is that they collaboratively own their own money and they build their own value and it can't be corrupted by state or corporations. And it gets very quickly, very complicated. We started out in 2015, and this is just to give a sense, it doesn't really matter exactly what the amounts are, but it gives a sense of what's happened in cryptocurrencies since we got started. So this was where we got started, and this is where it was by October 2017. Cryptocurrencies are very high levels of volatility. Again, it kind of has a kind of similar feel to what happened in the early days of the web with these kind of bubbles and crashes and people kind of proposing things and people uh, investing a lot in them. Now I'm going to come to the book. So the book has, it's broken into three sections. We have documents, fictions and theories. The documents are documentations of artworks. The fictions are stories, they're speculations on a world after blockchain and theory really kind of set, it's a set of, uh, it's a set of theoretical explanations of what blockchain is, of some works that are already underway. Uh, there's an analysis of the relationship between what is promised and what happened in uh, 1970s conceptual art and value of art and that kind of stuff. And now I'm going to talk about some of the artworks that we actually have in the room. So uh, one category of artwork are these kind of artworks that are proposing themselves as new life forms and autonomous agents. So we have Terra Zero, which asked whether an augmented forest can utilise itself. Uh, it's produced by uh, three guys based in Berlin who've bought a three hectare three hectares of uh, forest and they've used the kind of forestry uh, databases for mapping the resource of all, each of the trees by width and height and health and type into the forestry database and um, then they're using a system of smart contracts to allow people to buy the assets and as they buy the wood or as they buy the wood, the forest gradually owns itself and it starts to take control of its own. It'll become its own cell phone. It'll become a cell phoning forest. Uh, the, you should ha have a look at the video. The video kind of sets out a, a kind of theory about this as a, as a kind of emancipatory nature emancipated from humans. I think it's a really creepy project. And really, kind of since we uh, showed this and since we had a bit of the Terra Zero forest at Furtherfield, they've kind of moved from it being a kind of tactical artwork that was looking to really explore what it did into kind of really making this a thing. So here we are starting to see a kind of corporate identity of the Terra Zero forest coming, coming into real. And I'm, I'm really quite uncomfortable about it, but see what you think. Um, Plantoid uh, is written about in the book by Primaveri, Primavera de Filippi, who's an artist who's part of an artist collective called Ocaos. Uh, the Plantoid is this metal plant uh, behind you here. It's a plant and a robot combined. Uh, as it says, plants need bees to reproduce themselves, but plantoids need humans. So you send Bitcoin or Ether. To the, so you tip it with Bitcoin and Ether and it dances and glows and behaves in a slightly revolting way in my view. And uh, the idea being that it makes itself attractive so that you give it more money and when it's a achieved a certain amount of Bitcoin or Ether, it um, commissions an artist to make the next plantoid. And there's, there's other plantoids. There's well. currently six plantoids, six child plantoids in the world. As the project evolves, it's being developed so that those who contribute money to it can then start to define the brief of the next thing that gets produced. So it's this kind of, um, it's a 
combined experiment with both governance and aesthetics because in each of the what, should, what, what Primavera refers to as the soul of the plantoid, this is its smart contract. It's where it kind of contains the rules about how it can be made, where it can be distributed, whether it can be owned, or whether, whether the money that it gathers needs to be shared with a charity. Or So it's kind of like setting all these kind of uh, the rules between it as a physical thing, how it moves and how its finance work uh, start to evolve, and they evolve down different strands. So that I think... This is, this is a very early blockchain-based artwork that kind of really kind of helps, it helped me to start to understand why it was interesting. Here we have the Satoshi Oath, which was written by Jaya Clara Brecker and Elias Haas. So Jaya Clara Brecker, she's a researcher looking into the kind of ethical, complex ethical problems behind blockchains. And Elias Haas is a developer who runs a lab called the B9 Lab which is uh, looking to bring diversity into blockchain development uh, groups. And they produced this oath, which is, so it's a kind of reworking of the Hippocratic Oath. So that's the oath that doctors sign uh, to promise to do no harm to humans. And uh, it deals very specifically and very precisely, I think, with some of the things that, where harm might be caused inadvertently. So looking at the fact that uh, of immutability, so the fact that once something has been deployed, it can't be undeployed, although things that have happened in the last few years might make us change our mind about whether that's still the case. Uh, neutrality, decentralization. And what, in these images, so in these images here that are also on display here, what Jaya Clara Brecker is doing is trying to unpick some of the hype and some of the generalizations in a very useful way. So she's saying, computational consensus, so this is the network of computers that have to come to consensus about a transaction having been made. She's saying this does not equal social consensus, and this is one of the kind of problems with the blockchain hype, is this idea that just because a whole load of computers can hash algorithms and say, yes, this is true, that is not the same as human beings deciding and deliberating about important questions. And also that decentralised computation does not equal decentralised power. And anyone who's had anything to do with uh, self-organising, flat kind of uh, decentralised organisational processes kind of will have a gut feeling for the value of that statement. In the book is also an interview with Holly Herndon and Matt Dryhurst. It's, it's one of the most optimistic uh, pieces in the book. Matt Dryhurst is, he's actually doing one of our next DAWO workshops where they're really looking at uh, cooperative and collective uh, organisations through the blockchain of musicians who can then uh, become co-owners of the label and become real decision makers and the blockchain actually enables quite kind of granular decision making. I'm, I'm optimistic yeah. about this. And that's uh, on SoundCloud then then, then then you'll have sound camp. Yeah. Just for the pleasure of it, I'd like to talk about this illustration which is on the which is on the cover of the book by Juhi Ham. I think this illustration is really kind of brilliant actually. So we have this, it's a metaphor obviously, but it's lots of hands all joined together. They kind of make a raft. They're all taking each other's pulse. So there's this sense of mutual, endless mutual monitoring, which might make you feel warm and cozy or it might you, make, make you feel horrified. So you've got the kind of uh, surveillance, the surveillance kind of, the surveillance and togetherness all together, which I think is a really great kind of analogy for some of the things that you might think about. And the final things that I want to talk about, there's a story in the book called uh, The History of Political Operating Systems, which does a, a really good analysis of, uh, well, in a, in a, through fiction, it does a really good analysis of this kind of idea that the world will be a better place if, if everything was organised by market systems. And it's posited 500 years in the future, and it says, like, can you imagine back in the day when barbarians determined their future just by the land in which that they were born? And it says instead here people are able to kind of uh, buy their way, buy, choose their governance, they select their governance online and they choose it and it's seen as much more just and, just and kind of sensible and logical.
And then we have the Bad Shy by Rob Myers, which is, uh, uh, have you heard of the Doge cryptocurrency? Mm -hmm. So this is, a, it was a joke currency that then turned into a real currency based on dogs, the Shiba Inu dog. And so there's a whole, and it had developed this whole, a whole language and it built, built on a kind of internet meme. And uh, so the book is written in Doge, which is this very strange language. And it's, it's about a world where all economy is a kind of reputation economy. And again, it kind of, you, start, you read it, it's funny, and then it starts to feel really uncomfortable. So I think it helps us to think about what the, one of the underlying principles or kind of drives for certainly some of the kind of early Bitcoin uh, rhetoric was this idea that the world would be a much better place if we could just marketize everything, you know, like get rid of government, get rid of regulation. What's regulation ever done for us? That kind of thing. This is the last slide. This is where we got to with our Daowo workshops. Uh, the, this is some of the things that we are now seeing beyond the kind of like really pushing at the expressive limits of blockchain and blockchain as a medium, but looking at potential for new funding models. Uh, yeah, I think we are looking at a rene renegotiation by fire of the economic and social value of art with or without the blockchain. Uh, lowering the cost for artists and collectives to organise through these decentralised autonomous organisations. And the, the way this might remodel and diversify collaboration, and I think that this is tongue in cheek. I wrote it, and it still feels, but it's kind of something to aim for. Some way, if we can find ways to kind of automate solidarity, so that we're kind of working together more, this feels like a good idea. And rethinking the relationship between artists and participants and audiences, uh, new imaginaries. Kind of, there's a lot of work that's just happened in the last year around fractional ownership collective production, all of this kind of stuff. And the thing that we have always been kind of uh, really quite obsessive about is this thing of just opening things up and not allowing them just to belong to other people. I think that's it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it. We're done. Thank you.